Um, well, hi everyone. I am delighted and honored to be able to introduce our Grand Rounds speaker today, Dr. Michelle Krask. <clears throat> Dr. Michelle Krask is a distinguished professor of psychology, psychiatry, and biobehavioral sciences at the University of California, Los Angeles where she is also a Miller Endowed Chair and Director of the UCLA Anxiety and Depression Research Center. Dr. Krask is a world-renowned expert in the area of fear, anxiety, and depression. She has over 460 peer-reviewed journal articles, as well as numerous academic books, self-help books, and therapist guides. She has been the recipient of extramural grant funding since 1993, and her research projects focus on a wide range of topics from risk factors for anxiety and depression among youth, cognitive and physiological aspects of anxiety, neural mediators of cognitive behavioral therapy, fear extinction, neural mechanisms of exposure therapy, uh, implementation of treatment in community settings and constructs and neurocircuitry of positive and negative valence systems involved in anxiety and depression. She is the Editor-in-Chief for Behavior Research and Therapy, and she's the past president of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, or ABCT. And on a personal note, I will share that one of the most formative ABCT talks that I have seen was Dr. Cross speaking when I was a graduate student. And I, I remember this talk so vividly, and I remember that I learned not just the content of her work, but what I also saw was an amazing example of the career arc that one can have as a clinical psychologist and a researcher. Um, her ability to translate basic psychological and neuroscience findings into real world applications that help our patients is truly inspirational. Um, and so I'm sure you will leave this talk inspired as well. And without further ado, I introduce Dr. Krask. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I'm pleased to be here today. I'm going to be talking about neuroscience-informed behavioral treatments for anxiety and depression. I'm going to be doing a little bit of an arc of my research, as Christine mentioned, so there's a lot to cover. But my goal is to give you an overview of, of how we've established basic findings and then made those findings applicable to the ways in which we treat anxiety and depression. And of course, why are we doing this? Because the problem of anxiety and depression is enormous in scale and impact. We know that anxiety and depression are the leading causes of disability worldwide. Depression is projected to become the leading contributor to global disease burden by 2030, above and beyond all other diseases. And this challenge of, of scope is met by the fact that currently only one half, in fact, less than one half of individuals who are anxious or depressed receive any kind of treatment, and that's in the United States. And furthermore, that our existing treatments, while effective, work only about half of the time, meaning remission rates hover around 50%. In order for us to develop more effective treatments, I've long argued that we need to do a much better job at understanding the engine that drives psychopathology and all of the different components of that engine that we need researchers to be coming together to study all angles of the problem so that we can get a comprehensive model. And only with that comprehensive approach can we actually elucidate the processes or mechanisms that will hone existing treatments to make them more effective and uh, develop more targeted, focused treatments that will be more effective than 50%. So today I'm going to be uh, focusing on two drivers of that engine. The first is the appetitive driver, the system that motivates us towards approach and goals and rewards. And the second is the defensive driver, the system that motiva motivates us to avoid threats and punishments. And I'm going to be focusing on disturbances in these two engine drivers that may explain anxiety and depression and that inform novel treatments. So let's begin with the factors on the left-hand side, the defensive system. Um, and I'll say up front that the sort of overarching principle is that a generalized expectancy of threat seems to be what characterizes those who are at risk for anxiety and possibly depression as well. 
Now to do this kind of work, I've long, for a long time now been doing longitudinal studies. This was the first one called the Youth Emotion Project with Sumaynuka and Rick Zinberg, where we took 18 to 19 year olds, sorry, 16, my slide is covered up by our images, 16 to 17 years of age and followed them for eight years to 24 to 25 years of age. And as you can see, this um, was a longitudinal study that um, took a lot of measurements. So we have uh, psychophysiology, we have stress hormones in the form of salivary cortisol, we have various aspects of cognition, attention, memory and bias and judgment. We have early adversity, ongoing life stress, temperament, and all of which to relate to symptoms and diagnoses. And this age range of 16 to 25 is a critical age range for the development of anxiety and depression. Now, as you might well expect, and as we had expected, it's clearly the case that the temperament of neuroticism, which is that vulnerability to negative affect shown here in the GNF score, as well as stressful life events, particularly interpersonal events, each are predictors, and these are hazard ratios, of the development of anxiety and depression. Here I'm showing the hazard ratio for major depression over a period of five years, and you can see both of these factors as significant predictors of who develops major depressive episodes over those five years. Um, interestingly, the interaction between stress and neuroticism was not a predictor in this model. But I think what's more interesting is what are the actual processes by which stressful life events and the temperament of neuroticism actually confer risk? So as I mentioned, we did collect cortisol responses. Uh, we do took six samples per day over four days. And here are the data averaged from the early morning awakening response, that's 30 minutes after awakening, and the strength or the amplitude of that response was then evaluated as a predictor of who developed depressive disorders. After controlling for all other factors in the equation, you can see that the strength of the response in terms of hazard ratios for prediction of major depression was significant out to 30 months. So early morning awakening response, a predictor of the development of major depression, and also, <coughs> excuse me, also a predictor of the development of social anxiety disorder, which was our most common anxiety disorder in the sample. But here, it was a predictor out to four years. Now, one interpretation, and I say that with a smile because it's only one, but one interpretation of the amplitude of the early morning awakening response is that it represents a state of preparation for the challenges of the day, a sort of waking in a state of defensive anticipation of what could go wrong. Uh, and I'll just say in parentheses as a note, once our people did develop an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder, what was correlated then was not the strength of the early morning awakening response, but a flattening of the diurnal rhythm across the course of the day. So there you see sustained stress hormone response over the course of the day once the disorder emerged. But the predictor of who develops the disorder is that early morning awakening response. And that, if we do interpret that as an elevated anticipation of what's going to go wrong today, it's matched by a cognitive bias, such that individuals who are at risk for anxiety and depression tend to interpret situations such as these, and such as these, in a threatening way. And that interpretation bias, the tendency to interpret ambiguous scenarios in a threatening way, is also something that is predicted by neuroticism. So neuroticism measured six months earlier than the test of interpretive bias is predictive of the interpretive bias, at least to uh, negative interpretive bias of social ambiguous scenarios. This is a complicated graph uh, table, but literally to say that after controlling for all other influences, this is the one that stands out and it's not due to a broad negative bias in responding it's specific to an interpretation bias of ambiguous scenarios. So we might have what you could call a generalized anticipation of threat associated with this cortisol response, 
and an interpretation of ambiguous situations is threatening, both being predictive of anxiety or depression. But let's look a little deeper. In the um, Youth Emotion Project sample, a subset underwent a test called Fear Potentiated Startle, where we're looking at the reflex of the eye, blink, which is a good measure of defensive anticipation. Um, and you can see here, the typical experiment would have electrodes attached um, on the chest for heart rate, on the fingers for skin conductance, around the eye for the strength of the eye blink reflex. And then there are two electrodes on the bicep. And participants are told that when this screen appears, they may receive a shock through those electrodes on their arm. And if the shock is going to occur, it will occur within the 10, last 10 seconds of that countdown that you see across the bottom of the screen. And they may receive up to three shocks, and each shock may be more intense than the last. They're shown four of these screens interspersed with four of these screens. When they're told you're safe, no shock will be given during this time while this screen is being shown. In fact, only one shock was given right in the middle of the experiment. There were four alternating danger and safe screens before that shock and four alternating danger and safe screens after that shock. And we evaluated the strength of the eye blink reflex, this measure of defensiveness to, as, through an auditory probe to each of these screens and averaged them out. And then looked to see, did this reactivity predict who developed an anxiety disorder or who developed a depression, a major depression over the course of four years. And what we found was that the strength, that there was a prediction of who developed an anxiety disorder. There was no prediction for depression here, which was our first and only time that we found a separation between anxiety and depression in the defensive system. Um, but nonetheless, what's interesting to note here, it was the strength of response to what should be a safe screen, albeit in the context of threat, but the overreactivity to the safe screen was the biggest predictor and significant predictor in terms of hazard ratios of who developed an anxiety disorder after that one shock in the middle of the experiment occurred. So after an aversive experience, Overreactivity to safety was a predictor of who developed an anxiety disorder. Everyone responded strongly to the danger. That did not discriminate. And it's this pattern of responding to safety, albeit in the context of threat, uh, seems to be an elevated expectancy of bad things happening in what should be safe conditions. And this could explain the spread of anxiety and fear after aversive experiences. Now, just to take a sort of clinical or, or real world example, I think it's useful to think of a child on a playground and they are bullied by another child. If the first kid is at risk for developing an anxiety disorder, what these data are suggesting is that when they next meet the bully, of course they're going to be afraid, but they'll also be afraid when they see other kids who are their friends on the playground. So the aversive experience has caused a generalized spread of threat. Now let's continue this theme, this theme and dig a little deeper and talk about what about the updating of information about what is dangerous and what is safe in the environment. And to do this, we use Pavlovian fear conditioning and extinction paradigms. And of course, these capture the fundamental processes of what's changing in our world in terms of what is dangerous and what is safe. And for those of you who are not familiar, very basically to do these experiments, we pair a neutral stimulus using a geometric figure with an aversive stimulus using a, usually an electric shock. And then we compare that to another geometric figure that's never paired with shock. And then over a series of trials, the geometric figure that's paired with shock here in the dark circle becomes a predictor of the shock. And you know that because we measure response even before the shock comes on. So in the anticipation phase of the shock, you see this growing anticipation of being shocked 
and this growing level of fearful arousal measured by skin conductance. Whereas the other stimulus that's never paired to the shock does not generate that conditional response because it's not a predictor of shock. So that's acquisition. We then go through extinction. Extinction represents a change in the conditions. It represents an updating of memory about this predictor, this thing that the CS plus that used to predict shock, because during extinction, there's no more shock given. And so the organism has to learn that conditions have changed. And you see that there's a diminution of the conditional expectancy of being shocked and of the fearful arousal. And then extinction test or retest as it's sometimes called is the, the long-term extinction effect. It's usually measured at least 24 hours later. And you can see there's typically some spontaneous recovery from the end of extinction, where you see a little bit surge in the level of fear of the CS plus and fearful arousal. And that's normal uh, because extinction is always more uh, fragile than acquisition. So experimental fear conditioning extinction is an excellent model for how we learn to acquire fears based on aversive experiences and how we learn to overcome those fears by new experiences that indicate that the aversive outcome is no longer present. It's also the basis of exposure therapy. Extinction is the basis of exposure therapy, which I'll come back to later. But what's critical right now is that what happens if extinction fails? If extinction fails, then you have persistence of fears. And what we have shown is that individuals who are at risk for anxiety disorders or who have anxiety disorders show a deficit in extinction. Now, this is a very old but very telling set of results. And here we have children, 8 to 12 years old. We have control kids. And we have children who are at risk for anxiety and depression because their parents were anxious or depressed. We take them through acquisition, we take them through extinction, and we test them one to two weeks later. You see the CS plus in blue, the CS minus in uh, gray, and this is the skin conductance response, the level of fearful arousal. And they go through acquisition, they go through extinction. There's a trend here for the at-risk kids to not extinguish as much, but look at this one to two weeks later. The control kids, have really extinguished their fear response from, to the CS plus. But the at-risk kids showed a mild extinction, but a real strength of responding. They have not extinguished one to two weeks later, as if they're holding on to the fears, despite all of the information they've learned, that this CS plus no longer predicts an aversive outcome, which for them was a loud tone. And if children have actual anxiety disorders, so here we're comparing controls to kids with anxiety disorders, you see the same pattern, it's just ex it's exacerbated. They show even more acquisition of fear, no extinction at all, and no extinction at long-term retest. So this explains why fears will persist in kids who are at risk for anxiety, or who have anxiety disorders, because there's a deficit somewhere in the updating of information about what this CS plus means. And this has been confirmed by meta-analyses by uh, many other researchers. Now, according to learning theory, extinction depends upon prediction error, where there's a difference between what is expected to occur and what actually happens, the surprise factor that the organism is expecting the US and it doesn't occur, as demonstrated here in this theoretical learning curve of associative strength, that as the organism goes through different trials of extinction, this is where the greatest potency of learning is taking place because it's the biggest point of discrepancy between what they're expecting and what actually happens. And then their expectancy goes down and it starts to match the actual experience and actually down here, very little learning is taking place, by the way. It's as if kids who are at risk for anxiety or adults in general who are at risk for anxiety or have anxiety disorders somehow have an impairment in this prediction error learning process. Uh, that each trial does not lead to that massive reduction in expectancy. 
In other words, the value of each individual prediction error trial seems to be mitigated, perhaps by that generalized expectancy of threat that I've already referred to. And so if we go back to the example of the playground, it's as if, you know, the child's on the playground, the bully, the kid that was bullying, being mean, has been rehabilitated. They're no longer mean, they're being very friendly. The child who's at risk for an anxiety disorder or who has an anxiety disorder will continue to expect that bully of the past, the rehabilitated bully, to be mean. So the fear persists over time. And in other research that I won't show that others have also demonstrated, taking our, continuing our example, if the bully was now accompanied by a teacher on the playground, so the teacher's constantly watching everything that's done, the at-risk child or the anxious child is still going to think that that bully is going to hurt them. They have a deficit in the transfer of safety. Now, there's one more step here. The natural output of continuing to expect to be threatened, even despite evidence to the contrary, the natural output is avoidance. Because why would you approach something that you think is going to hurt you? But unfortunately, avoidance behavior literally prevents extinction from ever taking place. It prevents exposure to the conditional stimulus in the absence of the US. We typically measure avoidance by having people uh, be asked to approach the thing that they're afraid of, like uh, somebody who's fearful of spiders being able to pick it up. And of course, anxious individuals are much more avoidant of the things that they're afraid of and of general aversive stimuli. They're even more avoidant at the cost of losing a reward. So you see in this experiment up the top here, we, went, we took people through regular acquisition of fear so they learned to fear the CS plus that was paired with shock and the CS was a facial image. They did not fear the CS minus because it was never paired with shock. So they've acquired this differential fear response. Then we gave them a choice paradigm where they get to choose a card deck represented with pictures of the CS plus or the CS minus. And if they choose the CS plus, they get to win. If they choose a CS minus, they don't get to win. And obviously more often than not, everybody chooses the CS minus more over the CS plus. E sorry, yes, more people choose the CS minus over the CS plus, even though they're not going to win because of the prior association with threat, but especially if people were anxious. So trait anxiety was a big correlate of being more likely to make this choice despite the loss of winnings relative to this choice. If we transpose that to the clinical situation or the social situation, it's the socially anxious person choosing to avoid social situations despite the cost of losing job opportunities, for example. So if we put it all together right now, and I know I'm making some sweeping statements, but it's like, uh, a representation of waking up to the day with an anticipation of things going wrong, the anticipation of threat, expecting ambiguous situations to be threatening, spreading the expectancy of threat to what should be safe cues, albeit in a threatening context, persisting in expecting threat despite the evidence to the contrary, and avoiding expected threat, which effectively eliminates the opportunity to update information about safety and consequently fears spread and persist. Now let's, consist, let's consider the potential brain to behavior pathways associated with this generalized expectancy of threat and uh, impaired updating of information. Uh, the threat circuitry, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, is believed to involve the amygdala, which is central to detection of threat, salient stimuli, and storing of associations. We have the insular cortex, very relevant to the representation of interoceptive arousal response. We have the anterior cingulate cortex, also relevant to the expression of fear. The hippocampus, very relevant to memory formation and contextual encoding and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex very involved in regulatory processes 
inhibition and believed to be quite central to fear extinction. And we've shown that disruptions in this threat circuitry have been observed in individuals with anxiety and depression. In our laboratory, um, we've done a number of um, studies. This, this is a study with socially anxious individuals relative to healthy controls. Imagine you're a socially anxious individual, you're in the MRI machine, you look up and you see a video of an audience that's forming. And you're told that this is the audience that is getting ready for you because after we finish this assessment, you're going to go in and give a public speech. So these are individuals who are fearful of public speaking, obviously. And they see the first audience member come in, the second audience member come in, the third audience member come in, and you see that the socially anxious individuals are having that elevated and persistent amygdala activation relative to the healthy controls. Now, imagine again, you're a socially anxious individual and you're being shown video clips of yourself giving a speech that was pre-recorded the day before and video clips of a well-known TV personality, Katie Couric, and you're seeing 30 second clips of yourself, Katie Couric, yourself, Katie Couric, and we're looking here at the connectivity between the right amygdala seed region and the right insula. And what we found is stronger connectivity between the amygdala insula in the socially anxious individuals as they observe themselves relative to Katie Couric in comparison to healthy controls. And we're thinking of this as an example of their most likely elevated fearful response as they view themselves. But in, in some ways, these are not surprising findings because these are people with social anxiety disorder being asked to face and, and view the things that they're afraid of, their very specific fears of being negatively judged. The more telling issue is whether individuals at risk for anxiety and depression or with anxiety and depression show a different neural response to generic threat. And for that, we go back to our Pavlovian fear conditioning and extinction paradigm. Uh, and to do this, we have another longitudinal study. Here, it's a study of 270 18 to 19 year olds who are selected to represent the full spectrum of risk for anxiety and depression and they're followed for four years. Uh, we do a whole bunch of measures all the way up to neural response to threat and reward. And the neural response is the measure of response to fear conditioning and extinction. The reward response I'll come back to later. And we're still actually currently measuring year four right now. But we're looking at right now, what I'm gonna show you is what are the brain regions of interest at time one, at year one, that seem to um, correlate with um, at, at symptoms of anxiety and depression um, in the fear conditioning extinction paradigm. And our most robust finding at this point is that during extinction, uh, anhedonia, interestingly, anhedonia, which is that diag transdiagnostic symptom of loss of interest and joy in usual activities. Controlling for all other symptoms, it's the anhedonia symptom that's most strongly linked with a heightened elevation to the CS plus in the amygdala, left, right, in the um, anterior insula, in the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. So as anhedonia heightens, as they get more anhedonic, you're seeing a stronger activation in those brain regions to the CS plus relative to the CS minus, sometimes because the CS minus response is reducing, always because the CS plus activation is increasing. This represents a lack of extinction. So they're still holding on. At the end of extinction, they're still holding on to that differentiation between the CS plus and the CS minus. They're failing to extinguish. Now, we have a lot more analyses to do. What we're just starting to look at is whether this pattern of brain responding during extinction predicts who develops anxiety and depression 
um, over the next uh, four years. And we are finding some initial effects that I just don't have, um, they're not sufficiently well developed to present right now. We need to do a lot more work on all of the connectivity analyses. But say enough to say that right now we believe there's something here to, to show that individuals are having, who are at risk for anxiety and depression showing a generic threat reactivity and a deficit in extinction even to generic threat. So that leads me to the next phase of what I want to talk about is how do we augment extinction? How do we augment and facilitate the updating of memory for stimuli that are no longer threatened? Because we need to do this because exposure therapy, that method of systematically and repeatedly facing the object of fear is based on extinction learning. It derived from extinction principles. It's presentation of the CS without the US. But people who are coming in for treatment for exposure therapy have deficits in that very process that underlies exposure therapy. So I've spent a long time trying to work at how do we augment extinction learning? And it's not just get rid of fear. It's how do you enhance the underlying learning that seems to be impaired in individuals who need exposure therapy. And we've examined a whole bunch of different behavioral strategies and some uh, pharmacological strategies as well. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, um, but I'll, I'll touch on a few of them. And I'm going to start with the prediction error. How do we leverage prediction error? Remember, as I said before, Prediction error is that mismatch between what the organism expects, they expect to be shocked, and it doesn't happen. And that seems to be the thing that's driving extinction learning, but people who are at risk or have anxiety disorders seems to have some impairment in that process. So we begin with how do we leverage that? And at the most simple level, at the simplest level, we always design exposures to violate expectancies, to create that mismatch. And what that means is, very literally, if the person says, I'm afraid of holding a spider because I think it will bite me, and I really think it's gonna bite me if I hold it for longer than a minute. I'm, I don't think it'll bite me before then, but after a minute of holding, I'm convinced it's going to bite. Then for us to be effective in creating a prediction error, we have to ensure that they hold the spider for more than a minute. If they hold it for less than a minute, it doesn't violate their expectancy. So at the very least, we always design our exposures not around fear level, but around expectancy of what are the conditions when you think the US, the negative outcome is going to occur, and let's create those conditions so you can learn that it does not occur. So what do you expect to happen? And sorry, and then after it happens, instead of focusing on their fear level, we really emphasize what did you expect, what actually happened, what did you learn, and what surprised you. So here we're trying to boost the prediction error value of each trial. We're trying to overcome that overarching threat expectancy, which seems to mitigate the data that they've just gathered to show them that they were not bitten in this case by the spider. And because of that possibility that expectancy of threat keeps resurging over time, we've also shown that if we continuously remind people after the exposure to reflect upon the difference, to reflect upon the prediction error, what did you expect and what actually happened when you did that exposure four hours ago? And then we have them redo that reflective experience 24 hours later and 48 hours later. And we found that that process of continued reminder of the prediction error actually results in significant improvements over regular exposure therapy. So these are fearful individuals who have spider phobia. They go through repeated sessions of exposure to a spider, either with that reflective experience afterwards or a control condition where they were reflecting about a class that they were in or something else they had to do during the day. And this is pre to post changes in fear of spiders and pre to post changes in how willing they are to get really close to a novel spider 
And you can see that the group that did that reflective prediction error um, rehearsal were doing better on both indices. And it's hard to find differences between exposure therapy conditions because everybody's getting exposure therapy here. Yet still, that continuous error, prediction error reflection had a benefit. But we can also manipulate the learning environment even more in order to augment that prediction error process. And here, what I do is I translate from rodent models with a, mod with a paradigm called compound extinction. And this is based on the notion that the absence of the US during extinction in the presence of multiple predictors creates a more potent mismatch than the absence of the US in the presence of just a single predictor. So if multiple predictors are there and you still don't get the shock, that should create more potent learning than just a single predictor and not getting shock. So clinical translation, if you had somebody who's fearful of spiders, they do exposure to a single spider. And then if you introduced another spider while the first spider is still there, um, then what that second spider will do is it'll raise the expectancy of being shocked or bitten, I should say, again. And remember, it's that mismatch where most learning takes place. So you get another chance for learning. When you're down at this level, there's very little new learning taking place. And we have indeed shown that that single versus compound extinction is more, the, the compound is more effective than the single. This was a laboratory study and it's complicated, but we took um, individuals through acquisition. We then extinguished them either to one single stimulus, which is the single group, or we extinguished them to a compound, which was two predictors together. They extinguished. Then we reinstated fear by unexpected shocks that just come out of the blue. That's a standard method for reinstating fear. And then we measured their response again after the reinstatement and found that those who'd gone through the single extinction showed a much stronger skin conductance response than the compound group and a stronger expectancy of being shocked than the compound. So this compound extinction does seem to be very valuable. There's yet a second way taken from rodent research by which we can manipulate prediction error, and that's called occasional reinforced extinction. And what that means that as you take people through extinction or exposure therapy, normally every trial is positive, meaning it's non-reinforced, meaning there's no US. Remember again, the theoretical learning curve, learning is starting to peter out down here. This is the way we typically do it. If you introduce an occasional reinforcement, meaning an occasional US, in this case being rejected, which is a very potent unconditional stimulus, what that will do is it'll bring the expectancy back up so that on future trials, when the US is again no longer present, there's greater mismatch and greater chance for learning. So of course, this occasional reinforced extinction is only ethically possible for the US's, the aversive events that are normative, like social rejection. We all get socially rejected. We would not use this paradigm to re-traumatize people with actual trauma, abuse, rape. It's not appropriate. But for traumas, of the sense that are normative, it seems reasonable to do. And we've shown in an experimental study that that works. The blue line here are people who went through regular extinction. So no shock was ever delivered. This is skin conductance and you see they extinguish fully. They reach zero response. This is the group that out of every eight trials, on two occasions, they were shocked. You can see their skin conductance response is all over the place because they're getting shocked every now and then. This is the same thing here for expectancy. The blue group, their expectancy goes way down. They learn they're not going to get shocked. The pink group, 
remain concerned that they're going to get shocked because they are getting shocked. So note that at the end of extinction, the pink group, which has received the occasional shocks, really hasn't extinguished. So their performance in the moment would say, whoops, they're not doing well. But when we bring them back a week later and take them through a test of long-term extinction, and this test is called reacquisition. So now every trial, they're presented four new trials of the CS plus, and each trial is paired with shock. So it's a test of how much does the extinction carry over to mitigate, to, to squash the relearning of fear. And the blue group that had fully extinguished before because they had no more shocks happening to them, they show that natural pattern of reacquisition of fear. But this group that had occasional reinforced extinction and had never really fully extinguished are showing a buffering effect where they're not acquiring, they're going in the opposite direction. So in our clinical work, we include both the deepened extinction and the occasional reinforced extinction. Now, we're moving here to attention, because remember, attention is critical to prediction error learning. It's also critical to any kind of learning. But the problem, of course, is that anxious people tend to avoid and they'll move their attention away from the threatening conditional stimulus. And we've shown that individual differences in attentiveness are a predictor of how well the person does with exposure-based therapies. In this study, we took socially anxious individuals and we had them exposed to rejecting videos or neutral videos. And we found that the uh, amygdala activation in response to the rejection versus the neutral videos was a pretty strong predictor of how well people did in terms of their outcomes from exposure-based therapies. So the greater the activation in the left amygdala during rejection versus neutral, the better the CVT outcomes. Now, amygdala is often um, used as the index of attention to threat. Um, so we look at this as if you're more attentive, perhaps you're more engaged in and learning the new associations as you go through exposure therapy. We've also found that on other cognitive paradigms that the more attentive you are to threat on dot probe task paradigms before exposure therapy, the better you do with exposure therapy. Again, like I've talked about before, it's better if we can actually manipulate the construct of interest, if we can manipulate attention. And so one way we've manipulated attention is through affect labeling. And what I mean by that is we have people go through exposure therapy to a spider, where they're getting close to and picking up a spider, but for every exposure trial, they have to label their emotional experience and something about the spider as they see it. Sitting in front of the ugly spider makes me nervous. So they have to look at the spider and come up with a statement of how they see it and how they feel. Compared to reappraisal, which is the standard of cognitive therapy, compared to distraction, compared to exposure alone. Um, and what we found is that affect labeling group, where they're actually forced to think about what does that spider look like then how does it make me feel? So they're attending to it very closely. They had to come up with different statements each time. Here we're looking at the change from the end of treatment to a week later with a novel spider. And you see the affect labeling group had a reduction from the end of treatment to one week later in their skin conductance relative to every other group. And they were more likely to get closer to a novel spider than at least the distraction group. We've replicated this finding in um, other spider studies and other public speaking anxiety studies. Most recently, we've piloted this same kind of procedure with PTSD in combat veterans. And all they do is they look at images of combat and they affect label how do they feel as they look at the stimulus. So again, the affect labeling is causing them to focus attention on the stimulus. And this is a very simple three week, twice a week, 20 minute each time procedure in individuals, combat veterans with PTSD. Um, 
pilot study, but we find that that actually improves their independent um, clinician rating performance in terms of PTSD, and that the symptomatic improvement on the CAP score correlates strongly with the reduction in amygdala activation to passive viewing of combat scenes, different combat scenes in the fMRI scanner. Pilot data yet to be replicated as with a lot of these things, obviously. So obviously affect labeling does more than just attention, uh, but it's at least influencing attention. I'm gonna to move to one final aspect here, which is context attenuation. Now, in contrast to fear acquisition, which tends to generalize very widely. We already talked about how fear generalizes, especially in anxious individuals. But for everybody, once we acquire a fear, that fear tends to generalize to other contexts. There's evolutionary value to that. In contrast, fear extinction tends to be gated by the context in which it's taking place. Again, evolutionarily adaptive. But what that means is that after extinction's over, if you retest the organism in the same context as that in which they went through extinction, you get pretty low levels of fear generally. But if you test them in a brand new context or the context under which they went through acquisition, you see a renewal of fear. This is called context renewal. We've replicated this quite a number of times in uh, phobic individuals as they go through exposure therapy if we test them in a different context or counterbalance later. Now, this is a problem, right? Because if the fear does not, if the fear extinction does not generalize, then we get a return of fear. So once people finish exposure therapy and they go into the real world, their fear will return. My colleague, Mike Fanzalo, has found that the hippocampus is really critical in contextual renewal of fear, and that he can interfere with hippocampal functioning, either through lesioning, or in this case, through a pharmacological agent, scopolamine. And if he administers scopolamine to rodents, as they go through extinction, he wipes out that context renewal effect that's seen when they go through a placebo or saline. So we set out to do the first human study for this. Um, so we took patients with social anxiety disorder who also had public speaking fears. We double blind randomized them to different doses of scopolamine, 0.5 milligrams, 0.6 milligrams or placebo. This was a proof of concept study because we had nothing to go on really to know what would be the effective dose here. Uh, but we double blinded them to one of these conditions. And then we took them through virtual reality exposure. So exposure in a virtual reality context. So they did seven exposure sessions spread out over three weeks. Each exposure session had seven trials, so seven extinction trials. And then we tested them four days later, which represented the same time that was occurring between each of the exposure sessions, drug-free to either the same virtual reality context that they did through exposure or a brand new virtual reality context. And then one month later, because time itself is a context, we tested them again to the same context as the one in which they went through exposure therapy, but now drug-free, drug-free, drug-free. Um, and of course, everything was counterbalanced. To test the effect of scopolamine on hippocampus, the best we could do was use a cognitive task, the mnemonic similarity task, which is hippocampally dependent. And as predicted, those who had scopolamine, whoops, I just skipped, those who had scopolamine, one or both of them had more errors in this task, and the placebo placebo group was more accurate in this task, which said to us, okay, scopolamine is doing something relevant to a task that is hippocampally dependent. Um, of course, it would be better if we could test that neurally, but that's what we had. So just as a reminder, what we were hypothesizing 
is that if scopolamine is working to interfere with hippocampal functioning, then the extinction learning should generalize more. It should generalize to this brand new context, and it should generalize to the same context, but spread out now a month later. And we did get some effects. So what we found was that when they were tested in that new context, the two placebo groups tended to show less fear arousal, this is skin conductance response, than the placebo group, whereas they did not differ in their response when they were tested in the same context as the one in which they'd gone through exposure. We also found that one month later, the two placebo groups showed less fearful arousal, this is again skin conductance, than the placebo group, Again, remember here that's drug free. And unexpectedly, across multiple measures, we found that even though the three groups started off at the same level of fearful arousal as they began exposure therapy throughout those seven trials of virtual reality exposure, the two scopolamine groups showed much less fearful arousal than the placebo group. So, what this suggests to us is that um, the scopolamine is potentially improving the generalization of fear learning or fear extinction and in reducing fearful arousal during exposure. Um, and or important to note, scopolamine was free of adverse events. I'm going to briefly skip over this because I'm just looking at my time and I want to move on. But this section that I won't have time to cover is about doing the opposite. It's about improving the um, specificity of learning of fear acquisition. I want to skip now over to the appetitive system. So here we're looking at the system that motivates approach towards uh, rewards and goals. And deficits in the anticipation of rewards, deficits in the attainment and consumption of rewards, the learning of rewards, has become recognized as another correlate and risk factor for uh, depression and anxiety. It used to be thought of as only relevant to depression, but actually it's relevant to both. So back to our Youth Emotion Project for a minute. These are the 16 to 17 year olds that we followed. And before I told you that neuroticism predicted anxiety and depression, also low trait positive emotions predicts the development of depressive disorders as well as anxiety disorders over four years. Um, and we've also found that low trait positive emotions, which is that low capacity to feel reward or to attain reward, um, buffers the effects of stressful events and we've recently shown that um, controlling for all other variables interpersonal support from others so strong interpersonal support from others is a predictor of the reduced risk for depression and reduced risk for anxiety so those who have no interpersonal support at greater risk, those with high levels of interpersonal support, which is thought of as another primary pathway to feeling reward, have um, low risk for developing depression or anxiety. Now, the brain regions associated with the anticipation of reward and the attainment of reward are typically the um, ventral striatum and orbital frontal cortex. And disruptions in this reward circuitry have been associated with depression and anxiety. Uh, Diego Pizzagalli is just one of many people who've been working in this area a lot. Um, what I'm going to show you here is yet again another study. This is called the RDOC study. This is 172 usable data points from individuals who have anxiety and depression. And this is just to demonstrate that when we take them through a monetary incentive delay task um, and when we present cues that signal to them that they're about to receive a reward, money, or they're about to lose money, we see the typical pattern of greater activation in anticipation of money 
also in anticipation of loss of money in the nucleus accumbens, as well as in the chordate head as part of the dorsal striatum. Um, and it's, we're looking now and finding that this pattern is muted um, by the presence of anhedonia or that low positive affectivity. Even more telling, I think, is what happens when they actually get a reward. So when they actually do get the money in the monetary incentive delay task, what we find is that, again, a little bit complicated, but this is level of anhedonia. So it's what this means is the higher the score, the more the anhedonia, which is low positive affect, the lower the activation in the orbital frontal cortex region. Uh, the higher, the lower the anhedonia, the higher the orbital frontal cortex. So I'm sorry, it's complicated. But basically what it's showing is hyposensitivity of the orbital frontal cortex as anhedonia increases when reward is actually given. And what's really interesting and, and how, uh, good to know here is that we've got the same exact pattern when we looked at our brain mapped project of 18 to 19 year olds, um, we took them through the same reward task, the monetary incentive delay task. And at the point at which they were actually getting rewarded, they got the money, you see a hyposensitivity of the orbital frontal cortex um, in individuals who have higher levels of anhedonia. So together, the evidence is suggesting that low levels of positive affect or anhedonia is a risk factor for anxiety and depression, and that deficits in the neural circuitry associated with reward attainment at least, uh, and perhaps also reward anticipation, uh, are characteristic of anhedonia. We still have to analyze all the predictive relationships here. So the last part of my talk here is to say, okay, if that's the case, how do we increase the behavioral and the neural anticipation of reward, the attainment of reward in individuals who show deficits in those areas. And this is especially important because treatments to date, whether it's pharmacological or psychological, have had pretty limited effects on anhedonia. They've been much more effective at reducing negative emotions, but not very effective at improving positive emotions. Ketamine um, and perhaps some other more recent pharmacological agents um, are showing promising results. But the traditional uh, antidepressant medication is not the case, and certainly not with psychological treatments either. So we developed a new psychological treatment, a new behavioral treatment to try to really target how do you improve that anticipation of good things happening? How do you improve the capacity to respond to good things in a positive way, to feel that positivity rather than dismiss it? And how do you learn that if I do this behavior, I'm going to get rewarded? Um, it begins with behavioral training and mental rehearsal. It's all about how do you savor positive events and associated emotions and sensations and thoughts? How do you recall that experience over and over and over again and focus all of the attention on the positive features of experiences? Uh, we do cognitive training where they're taught to really zero in on positive features of complex stimuli, to imagine over and over and over again positive outcomes of future events and to correct the cognitive bias and teach people to attribute positive outcomes to themselves when it's appropriate. And it includes what we call cultivating positive emotions through intentions and actions of loving kindness, gratitude, generosity, and appreciative joy, all taken from the mindfulness research, but combining meditative reflection with actual actions where they go out and engage in these behaviors. Um, and we conducted a randomized controlled trial where we took patients who were anxious or depressed and had some functional impairment, and we randomly assigned them to either this positive affect treatment or to a negative affect treatment, which essentially is traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, where everything is about how do you reduce negative emotions. 
And here, everything was about how do you improve positive emotions, increase that brain muscle, as we called it, to be able to anticipate and receive positive experiences in life. And we, we, we were very good at maintaining differentiation. All of our independent ratings of the content of the sessions showed there was no or very, very little um, uh, diffusion here across the two treatments. And we assessed them at post and six month follow up. Now, in terms of positive affect, what we found is that the group that went through positive affect treatment showed a nice improvement in positive affect all the way up to the normative population level, which has not been shown before. None of the psychological treatments ever get people up to this level. And it was more effective than the comparison treatment. That was good. It also was more effective at reducing negative emotions compared to the standard treatment unexpected for us, but that was good. It was also more effective at reducing depression and stress, which is a measure of anxiety. And I don't have it here, but it was also more effective at reducing suicidal ideation. We're now replicating this study um, and getting very similar preliminary results. We've also moved into doing virtual reality again, because virtual reality is an outstanding way of bringing the positive experience to the patient. When we work with anhedonic individuals, people, particularly individuals who've been chronically anhedonic and not able to motivate themselves to get out and do positive things, let alone even find them if their lives have been isolated, um, it's very difficult for them to do regular between session homework practice where they go and find something to do that would be rewarding. So bringing virtual reality to them overcomes that barrier and also gives us excellent experimental control over what they're being exposed to. So the way we do this is we have them view virtual reality scenes that are very uplifting. They have to really find the most positive feature of the scene as they progress through the treatment, there are more and more neutral scenes which they have to work at to find the most positive feature. And then after they've finished the virtual reality, we have them then go through a, re a recall where they rehearse everything they saw, particularly the most positive features in first person perspective. And then we have them expand that to an autobiographical memory. And what we're finding in our pilot study, and this is very, very small right now with six participants, we're seeing that it's massively effective in reducing anhedonia. It's also effective in reducing depression and anxiety and increasing functionality. And we're seeing from pre to mid to post treatment increases in areas of the orbital frontal cortex as they go through that monetary incentive delay task that I showed before during the reward phase. Um, and so we're now sort of extending this out. So I'm going to conclude by saying that this, I hope has given you a glimpse of how we're trying to look at um, both the defensive system and the appetitive system in order to find the areas of deficit so that we can make our treatments more targeted and precise. And of course, where we want to go is actually look at these two systems in interaction with each other. So thank you very much. Thank you. Lovely talk. So I think we're open for questions. If I can just find my question screen. Yes, if you have any questions for Dr. Kraft, feel free to use the Q&A tab at the bottom. I know it was a lot, and sometimes it's hard to ask questions when there's so much being presented. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll start. I, I, first of all, I want to thank you for um, just a tour de force, um, just a really, really um, very exciting and stimulating overview of, a, of your body of work um, and, and pulling in a number of um, kind of, uh, how should I say, I mean, what's so, what's so really impressive about your work is how you have uh, tied together really, in a sense, both experimental paradigms and, 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 and findings from 
kind of classical psychological experimentation and psychology, um, fear conditioning, fear extinction, and how you've pulled this into um, more uh, evolving and current, um, essentially, um, neuroscience paradigms, mm -hmm. um, such as you know, prediction error, um, the distinction between hippocampal learning systems and, and really some of these subcortical learning systems, the positive affect system and the negative affect system. I mean, that's really what's very exciting about your work is you're providing this, this paradigm that draws together what's been observed for for decades, if not centuries, with, with you know, current, current neuroscience. Um, specific question, um, sort of just wanted to, you, you, you sort of said it in passing, I just wondered if you'd riff a little bit more on this idea that uh, some of this kind of attention training that you added where you sort of train people to attend to the threatening stimuli, uh, obviously there's more going on than simply attending. Uh, yeah. there's, there's verbalization, et cetera. So I just wonder again, if you could sort of riff a little bit on what you think sure. of the mechanisms. Yeah, sure. Yes. And so the, the work that I've done on affect labeling has been in collaboration with Matt Lieberman in our department. Um, and really, you know, it, it, which it sort of represents, represents the way I do things. I listen to my colleagues in, in the sort of behavioral neuroscience, the cognitive neuroscience, the social neuroscience. I say, oh, that could really be clinically relevant. So then we come together and we work together and we do studies together. And that's what I did with Matt. So I listened to one of his early discussions on the role of affect labeling, or as he says, putting words to feelings. Now he has a very specific disruption model, which is that by using linguistic processing, his, um, there's activation of the right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, which then has perhaps through the medial prefrontal cortex, a down regulatory effect upon the amygdala. Mm -hmm. um, and that that is what accounts for the sort of um, uh, positive benefits. It's a, like implicit emotion regulation. Mm -hmm. And right. so we began by doing studies where we just used the uh, affect labeling task with socially anxious individuals and healthy controls. And we do find that um, what we actually find in those studies during an affect labeling task, and you, the standard affect labeling task is you're presenting you know, facial expressions, and you were asked to label the facial expressions in comparison to labeling the gender versus shape matching and so forth. And we found that socially anxious, particularly depressed socially anxious individuals, while they showed the regular right ventral lateral, uh, uh, right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex activation as they were affect labeling relative to all the other conditions, their amygdala activation remained as elevated as before. It wasn't, it wasn't being influenced. And so there seems to be some functional connectivity issues going on there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole body of other sort of neuroscience mechanisms going on in affect labeling than just attention. Mm -hmm. um, so it's another body of research that I work on too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. But it's so, I, it's so interesting. And if there are clinicians in the audience, we, you know, when we take people through exposure therapy, we do not do cognitive therapy because cognitive therapy is change the way you think. It's a, it's an effortful change the way you're thinking as you face the thing that you're afraid of. We feel that that takes away from the implicit experience of what's going on and the learning that's taking place through experience and that affect labeling is a much more effective strategy as people go through exposure. So we, we simply ask our patients, just label what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very reminiscent of, right, of, of, of mindfulness-based work. It, and it fits don't very judge. much with that, yes. Right. Don't judge it, just, just label it and then let it go, yeah. yeah. I mean, there is the, the sort of caveat, label it, but keep going. <laughs> you know, you have to approach, <laughs> you can't avoid. So it's a mindful labeling plus approach. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think there are questions yeah. here. Christine, do you want to moderate? Um, sure. So there, there's a question about whether treatment providers and patients, I guess we can add, find positive affect treatment to be more positive than straightforward or traditional CBT. That's so interesting. Yeah, clinical hat on right now. Um, patients love it. Therapists love it. <laughs> Um, and you know, you know, I'm a, I'm really at heart an exposure therapy researcher. That's where I began, and that's difficult. 
exposure therapy is difficult for patients and exposure therapy is difficult for therapists. So um, I, I just have to accept, I'm being mindful in my acceptance that uh, the positive affect therapy is more appealing because it's, it's easier and it's uplifting. We're uplifting mood. We focus on mood improvement. We don't, uh, I mean, obviously negative affect reduces as well. So we've found, you know, there are obviously occasional patients who just feel like it's missing the boat for them, so to speak, like, how can I attend to the positive when all these terrible things are happening in my life? And I think at some point in the future, there'll be a way of bringing these two approaches together. But for the sake of you know, mechanistic research, we, we pulled them apart. So once you're in positive affect treatment in our trials, we do not talk about negative affect. And when it comes up, we encourage the therapist to just guide the person to, but the focusing on building the positive is all we need to do. That will, that will eventually reduce the negative. But yes, to answer the question, it's very well received. Mm -hmm. We have a, another question about PAT. So um, in terms of which strategies seem to be the most powerful, memory savering, self-referential attribution. So, so sort of which components do, is your sense could be contributing yeah. most to outcomes? Yeah. So when we look at the, that slide that I showed of the positive affect, um, let me just pull that up for a second here. So the first seven weeks here of this treatment are all the behavioral activation where patients are asked to go out, find rewarding activities, they come back in the session and the whole session is spent on the memory specificity and recounting of what happened, really teaching people to slow down, recall the most positive feature in first person, uh, with attention to detail of the, of the feelings they had, the sensations, the situation. Then week eight, nine, and 10 are all cognitive training, where they do that set of three exercises about looking for the positive, imagining the positive, and attributing positive outcomes to self. And 10, 11, 12, 13, I might have been off by one week there, it's it's up to eight for behavioral activation, then nine, 10, 11 are cognitive, and 12, 13, 14, 15 are uh, the cultivating positive emotion through sort of loving kindness, generosity, appreciative joy. And what you see is the positive affect just builds over time, right? So it looks as if every component is adding, but that could be just time alone. The design that we have does not enable us to pull these things apart. The virtual reality that I'm doing just takes this first eight weeks and just does exposure to virtual reality images that are positive with the recounting afterwards. So that's suggesting that that is effective, but how much more these other things add on is, is a little unclear at this point. And in the perfect world, we would do the next study where we dismantle all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I'd like to interject my own question. So I've been thinking about this in terms of our pivot to telehealth for so much of our treatment. Um, and so what are your thoughts about how we can best capitalize on the telehealth platform to overcome some of the context specificity of fear extinction that you talked about? Yeah. Uh, so, well, that's interesting. Um, so generally speaking, in fear extinction, the context that is gating, that gates the prediction error learning, gates extinction, is anything that's in that context. And probably things that are salient will be gather more of the gating power. So the therapist, the therapy room, uh, whatever it is that gets associated with coming into and leaving therapy, all of that is context. Internal state is also a context. Um, so, just like regular therapy, when you're seeing a person in the office, telehealth is a context um, because you're, you're seeing a therapist uh, on the screen, which means that 
if you instruct people, if you're a therapist and you're doing exposure with somebody through telehealth, let's say you're my client, I'm saying, okay, we're going to do interoceptive exposure now. I want you to do some hyperventilation. Theoretically, the, the learning that's happening is going to be tied to us doing it in this context. So we always want to get people to practice in lots of different environments outside of the context that they're receiving the therapy. And that's the same for telehealth as in person. It's just the same. I think the riskiest thing for telehealth is, you know, normally when we do exposures, we'll do a lot of in vivo exposure. So we'll take the, you know, we, we have clients who come to our clinic and then we walk outside with them and we do a whole bunch of exposure, like interacting with people or going into stores. And we can't do that right now because of the pandemic. Um, it's not safe to ask people to go and interact with other people. And so the, I think my fear is that it's not telehealth per se, it's the pandemic that's going to result in some limitations on our attempts to overcome context specificity. Lots of challenges for us to overcome. It is. I mean, in so many ways, telehealth is fantastic because we can, we do a lot of social exposures on, on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So we have the patient up on Zoom and then we bring in confederates on Zoom and they do debates with the confederates or they'll do uh, discussions with the confederates and that works well but it's still all on Zoom. <laughs> great, great, great. Okay, so we have another question. Um, they're asking if uh, you've begun to examine how threat and reward detection systems interact and optimal ways to treat both simultaneously. Yeah, so a body of research that I haven't, that I didn't talk about is that we have been looking at how can we activate the reward system through extinction? Because extinction, the process of, of you know, updating memory about the safety of what used to be a dangerous stimulus does seem to involve reward processes. There are definite dopaminergic signaling and there's definite uh, relief associated with prediction error that seem to be connected to the positive valence system. So how can we harness the positive valence system as people are going through extinction to maximize its role? And so we've done a series of studies, that, they're interesting studies, where we try to evoke or induce positive emotions as people go through extinction. So the clinical translation would be as the person's um, extinguishing, you know, doing exposure therapy, we're trying to induce positive affect uh, by music, by uh, positive imagery training that I talked about in Pat by using positive imagery training just before they start exposure or by um, something that actually becomes more like a conditioned inhibition, but by information about the thing that they're afraid of that's very positive. So we are trying to look at those. It's difficult work to do. And, and I think there may eventually be much more room for pharmacological methodologies for inducing positive affect as people go through exposure therapy. Yeah, I was just gonna say some neural feedback, maybe with the ultrasound neural feedback uh, methodologies too. Yeah, it's an interesting endeavor. Just time to think about it, but I think that's definitely an area to go. Uh, another question is, have you looked at ADHD as a factor in how patients respond to positive affect training? I have not. Um, I'm trying to think. I'd be interested to know the thinking there. Uh, and of course, substance use is one that I have thought more about, but I don't know enough about the ADHD area to know the role of positive valence in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, there's a question about um, anhedonia as a cause or effect. I'm not sure, but I'm wondering if it's, it's about some of maybe your, um, the correlation data you presented with, yeah. you know, what, what you think there. Yeah, yeah. So, so in our, I think that's referring to our uh, looking at anhedonia in relation to extinction at the neural level 
where we're finding a correlation. So the higher the anhedonia, the lower the extinction, the, the worse the extinction, I should say. I, yes, it's impossible to say at that point what's what, but we are now looking at whether the neural response to fear conditioning extinction and extinction recall predict symptomatology over four years um, and starting to find some evidence of relationships where there's a prediction of anhedonia. There's also a prediction of fears, sorry, not fears, general distress, but that's all very, very, you know, we're still working on trying to analyze those data. Um, yeah, the chicken and the egg, you know, what comes first? Uh, uh, this, this is a question that plagues psychology a lot. Um, is, it, is it a neural brain biological mechanism that's leading to the symptoms? Is it vice versa? I tend to think it's reciprocal. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll follow up with another question about anhedonia. So this person says, in my experience with depression, anhedonia is the biggest obstacle in treatment even when targeted directly, like with behavioral activation. Specifically, I've encountered patients seemingly unable to feel positive emotions in treatment-resistant depression. Yeah. I have moved toward finding meaning rather than hoping for joy. Any tricks for those hard-to-treat anhedonia? Ah, that meaning versus joy is very interesting. So um, I totally agree. That's, I think that's why behavioral activation therapy as a standalone therapy, which was developed years ago, and as many of you know, was really developed to increase you know, engagement in rewarding activities. Um, although if you look at the list of 193 rewarding activities that were generated in 1973, we would not think of them as rewarding nowadays, but there you go. Um, but the biggest problem is that behavioral activation therapy, was, which was based on response contingent reinforcement, was supposed to be inducing um, you know, motivation and positivity has not been very effective at improving positive affect for the reason that that um, person just indicated that people were, you know, the therapists were saying, go and do this activity and you'll feel better. And you'll notice your mood has improved. And many patients will say, I don't feel better. And it, what's the point? And I, I don't feel like I can do this. So that was why we built this, you know, the central part of our first treatment section is not just exposure to an activity that used to be rewarding to them or in virtual reality that is positive. It's the memory that we work on pulling up the memory and really saying we've got to build the muscle for positive attention and encoding. So we want you now to go back to that activity that you did and you didn't find very rewarding at the time and think through what was there any part where you felt a slight shift in emotion? All right, let's grab that part. What were you seeing in front of you there? What were you feeling in your body? Let's relive that experience. We do a lot of this memory specificity red counting. But to the second point that that um, uh, question asked, we do it not just for inherently rewarding activities like listening to great music, being out in nature, eating good food. We do it for activities that the person finds consistent with their values. So even if it's not inherently rewarding in the moment, it provides them a sense of accomplishment of something that's valued to them. So a little bit more of the acceptance and value driven work is built into this for that reason, that it's meaning um, that can also lead to um, motivation to engage in activities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, I think we have time for one last question. Um, so this is going back to exposure. So what about anxiety patients? I, I think this mostly OCD kind of patients is what I think of in which prediction errors can't be engineered in an exposure. For example, if I don't pray in a very specific obsessional way, I'll go to hell. Yeah. So for OCD patients, and this is also true sometimes for GAD, where there's a future-oriented prediction, like 20 years from now, my child will be failing because I'm a parent that fails. So you can't test that out unless you do a 20-year exposure. So uh, for those individuals, we do more of a distress tolerance prediction. 
um, which is that you'll never know, and now you're learning to tolerate the uncertainty of the outcome. So it's a little, it's a little trickier, um, but that's the way we do it, and it works. It's just theoretically not as nice. You know, I'm going to jump in with one more just because I think this is a super interesting question from uh, the person above, Ryan Webler. This is um, it's, it's kind of an exposure therapy prediction error implicit learning question. How do you resolve the tension between increasing early patient buy-in, i.e. using affirmative language, this is going to work, here's some potential reasons why, and trying not to reduce threat expectancy too much so that you can maximize prediction error? Yeah, so again, we don't do cognitive restructuring prior to exposure. So the typical methodology of the years has become you do cognitive restructuring to reduce threat expectancy, and then you do exposure with the thought being that the reduced threat expectancy will facilitate people getting into exposure. So in our trials, we do not do cognitive restructuring before. We do it after in the sense that we're getting them to think about what did you learn? What do the data show you? What does that mean? And so forth. So our buy-in is... It's trickier, right? Because we're not helping them. We're saying we want you to do the thing that you're most afraid of without telling you that you're not going to get hurt by it. But, you know, you have to also realize the, the client is, is trusting us. They, they know that we're designing exposures that are not going to put them at actual risk. So there's an implicit trust. And we emphasize up front the role of disconfirmation. We emphasize, you know, it would be words like, imagine. So we create this, this nexus of all the things that predict what they're afraid of happening and all of their conditioned inhibitors actually. So we create this nexus and then we say, okay, so you're, you're thinking you're gonna be rejected and the predictors of that are talking to authority figures, expressing your opinions and blushing while you're doing it and your, your inhibitors, your safety signals are, um, you know, averting your eye gaze and standing at the back of the group. And then we'd say, just imagine, just imagine if you were able to talk to authority figures on opinions that you have while you're blushing, without your, um, you know, while looking at them, without averting your gaze, and while right in front, just imagine doing that and nothing bad happening. What do you think that would free up for you? So we try to inspire the patient to recognize that this kind of direct experience could shift their whole life. Um, so that's the way we do it. It's more through rationale giving than through specific exercises of cognitive restructuring. And our attrition rate is no different than attrition rates for regular therapies. Great. Well, thank you again. And thank you, Christine, for inviting Dr. Krask. It's been really, a really wonderful presentation. We didn't get to quite every single question, but um, it's, uh, uh, you've given us a lot of uh, kind of food for thought and a lot of inspiration to kind of go back to some of your papers. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And Michelle, I think you and I are scheduled.